Everyone can see my screen, yes? Yes. Awesome, all right. So we're gonna walk through um, how we go about organizing and leading uh, shoreline cleanups. And um, first, just a little bit of uh, background on our organization. Um, and I always like to start with this because I happen to be an anthropologist by training. And so um, Margaret Mead is, you know, one of my my favorites and one of my inspirations. And, you know, she's sort of famous for this quote, this idea um, that anybody can be a change maker. Right. And it usually begins in the grassroots. It usually begins uh, with uh, small groups of people doing what they need to do. And that uh, from there goes on to create a movement. And so that's a lot um, that is sort of the history and the story of volunteercleanup.org. So um, this is us, uh, me and my partner in all things, Dave Dobler, are the co-founders of volunteercleanup.org. Um, but we came to this work through um, being involved in, you know, the corporate uh, private sector for a long time. I'm a, an anthropologist, as I mentioned, by training. So I'm sort of uh, really deeply rooted into consumer insights and behaviors and uh, from that became very interested in how to get people to live uh, more sustainable lifestyles. So after working in the corporate sector for a long time, Dave and I started this as a side project and um, that became uh, a little bit more of a main project as uh, we got deeper into it. So um, we run the nonprofit. I also run a, a women's philanthropic group called 100 Women Who Care. Uh, I work with the Rhythm Foundation, as I mentioned. Uh, and I really focus on the day-to-day -day operations of the nonprofit as executive director, whereas Dave, as our director of development, also um, does a lot of more of the political side and the advocacy. So he um, has a number of positions, including um, the Biscayne Bay Watershed Advisory Board. Um, he was formerly the chair of the Miami Beach Sustainability Committee. He's now the chair of the North Bay Village Sustainability Committee, uh, but he's still involved in Miami Beach, um, their waterfront protection uh, and also heads up the um, Biscayne Bay Marine Health Coalition. So we, we do lots of things uh, within the environmental space um, outside of running the nonprofit. Um, but we got started in this work uh, kind of by accident, um, just sort of being good Miamians. Uh, we like to get out on the water and paddle. And uh, as we were doing so, we started to notice a lot of trash. This is about maybe 10 years ago that we started getting involved in this work. Um, just, you know, paddling on Biscayne Bay and seeing a lot of trash and picking it up, you know, little by little on our own. Um, I'll never forget the day that I'm standing on my balcony and I see Dave coming back from one of his outings and he's got all kinds of things strapped onto his little kayak um, from his adventures in Biscayne Bay. And, you know, the first thought I had was, wow, you know, we're going to need to get him a bigger boat uh, to put all this trash on or we're going to need to get a lot more help. And so that was sort of the genesis of our advocacy work. We started, you know, organizing, um, you know, small informal cleanups with friends. And, um, you know, just sort of, you know, asking, hey, who wants to meet up at the beach this weekend? Let, let's go do a cleanup, right? And so it was really just an informal thing. But every single time we would do the cleanup, there would be two questions that people would come up and ask us. They would either say, hey, when's the next cleanup that I can participate in? Or do you know my friend, you know, Billy, John, Laura, uh, they do this thing too, right? They're weirdos who like to pick up trash. And so we realized at that moment, it was sort of a big aha for us was that um, there were lots of people who were interested in, in joining and participating. And there were also small pockets of people already doing this kind of work. Um, but there was really no way uh, to connect the dots. And so, you know, sort of being um, good technologists, Dave, I should mention, worked in cybersecurity and I was in a digital advertising agency. And so uh, the first thing that we thought is, well, clearly we, we must create a website, right? That is the solution for all things. Um, so we uh, woke up one morning, we registered a domain, and that was um, the genesis of volunteercleanup.org. And it was just sort of built on a very, very simple idea that, you know, what if there was a place where people could find out where the cleanups were, or if they were somebody who was organizing a cleanup that they could get the word out. And so um, that's what we did. And from there, it grew into a nonprofit. When we started, it was just, you know, a website. Um, but then um, we became an official 501c3. And we formulated our mission, um, which was really to get volunteers out to clean their neighborhoods, their shorelines, and their waterways 
uh, very specifically as a way to raise awareness for the problem of marine debris. And that the hope was that by people participating in this experience, it would inspire and encourage them to get more involved in the issue or especially to reduce their own reliance uh, on single use plastics. Um, and so we, we're not naive about the fact that, you know, we don't, we know that cleanups, you know, are not the long-term solution, right? In many ways, um, they can be a band-aid approach. They can be a very short-term uh, solution to the problem. Certainly they have an immediate impact on the local marine environment, um, but cleanup alone is not going to solve the problem. But we do feel very strongly um, that they're a very important educational experience, that they provide this eye-opening, uh, you know, window into the the issue um, that then can be the catalyst for behavior change. So that's really uh, why we do what we do. And creating the website um, is really about, you know, creating this grassroots effort because we learned very early on that we are two people and we can really only be in one place at a time. And so that we really couldn't scale our impact uh, by Dave and I leading cleanups. But if we could clone ourselves, so to speak, if we could get others to do this, um, that we could really have a movement around this issue. Um, and so in the community today, we function um, with like three specific programs. This is where we focus our efforts. Uh, our primary program is the volunteercleanup.org website. Um, it is the go-to destination online for people to find out about local shoreline cleanups or to create their own. On any given weekend, there's about between, I would say, six to 10 cleanups happening in the South Florida and Miami area. Um, where hundreds of people every single weekend are signing up to attend these cleanups. So they're very well attended. And we have a network of partners that are organizing cleanups in, in all different areas. Uh, we are also the county coordinators for the International Coastal Cleanup Day. That is a global event that happens every third Saturday in September. It's spearheaded by the Ocean Conservancy on a global basis. So they've been running this event for Oh, 37 years, uh, and it's, you know, hundreds of countries and millions of volunteers participate in this worldwide event, but we're the county organizers. We are their partner for Miami-Dade. Uh, so every September, we organize a, a countywide effort with about 60, it's grown, 50, somewhere between 50 to 60 simultaneous cleanups on one single day, and we usually remove between 15,000 and 22,000 pounds of trash in a two-hour period across the county. Um, we also do private events, um, you know, mostly team building events and corporate days of service. Um, we don't do a whole lot of public cleanups ourselves, again, because our mission is to kind of train and facilitate other groups to do it and to scale the impact. So that's, you know, really the idea of today's workshop is, um, you know, how can we find more Marys out there to um, get involved in their neighborhood and, and do cleanups and kind of share what, what we know. Um, you know, so I spoke to this a little bit, right? The idea is that, you know, the cleanup's not the answer, um, but it is a really important part. It's a stepping stone, we think, to, um, you know, just engagement in a whole range of environmental issues, um, or it can be just sort of that, you know, um, experience that encourages people to make behavior change in their own lives. You know, I think a lot of people, they don't know what they can do about climate change, or they can't see climate change, or, you know, it feels so massive, but anybody can tend to beach cleanup. Um, so it's a really easy entry point um, where people can start to get involved. And we really think it's important in community building, you know, connecting people uh, to each other, you know, and from there, um, people organize and, and get more involved in their communities and, and start to tackle uh, uh, bigger issues. So um, the way that I'm going to go through um, our process is I'm going to talk about all of the things that happen before you actually have the cleanup. So the planning stages, so to speak. And then, you know, what happens on the day of the cleanup? How do you actually run the cleanup? And so, you know, before the cleanup is all the logistics and the planning, choosing a time, date, and location, um, the kinds of approvals that are required, uh, posting the cleanup to volunteercleanup.org. I'll go into detail about how our website works how you can promote the cleanup, send your reminder emails, the supplies that you're going to need, those sorts of things. Um, during the cleanup, and I've got, you know, more details on each of these steps, how you set up a table, you know, you check in your volunteers, what the waiver process is, um, the kinds of remarks you might want to give to your volunteers, especially in terms of safety briefing and the instructions. Um, and then what we do at the end of the cleanup, how we instill um, the educational <clears throat> messages that are a part of that. 
So one of the things that we talk about when choosing um, a date and location, most cleanups tend to be on the weekend mornings, um, but that doesn't have to be. Um, but certainly you want to keep note of the sunrise and sunset times. You don't, you know, that changes throughout the year. Some days it's 530, so that's very early. Uh, so you certainly want to make sure you're finished with your cleanup or starting your cleanup um, during the daylight hours. Um, the other is the tide schedule. So that's not as important on the beaches of Miami Beach, but if you're on Biscayne Bay, if you're on the mainland, say at Margaret Pace Park, um, there are days, especially during the king tides, when the tide levels can be very high. And so what that means is the, the shoreline cannot be accessible, right? It can be very small. Um, so we usually encourage people to find times that are uh, either low tide or certainly within a two hour window of the high tide uh, so that they have more access to shoreline. Otherwise you could be up to your feet, you know, potentially uh, in, in water. You obviously wanna choose a, a time and date um, where you've got the staff that you're gonna need to help. So those are some of the considerations with choosing a time and date, holidays and so on can be big traffic areas. Um, in terms of locations, there's a number of different terrains that have different pros and cons, right? So you've got your, your you know, your typical, flat sandy beach, right? Any, any, pretty much anywhere on Miami beach. Um, and, you know, those can be um, really good for shedding light on some of the microplastics that we have washing up ashore and some of the trash that gets caught in the dunes. But for the most part, um, the, the beaches in Miami beach are fairly well maintained. So the county has tractors that come in uh, every morning and sweeps up the beach um, and really picks up the big pieces. So there's always lots of cigarette butts, some straws, even though there's not supposed to be and plenty of microplastics. On the other hand, and so I will say the flat sandy beach is great if you've got young kids, right? So it's a safe environment um, if you're doing something with school age kids. On the other hand, if you go around to Biscayne Bay, any of the parks that are on the other side. So if you just go from where we are, Pelican Harbor area, you know, down Legion Park, Morningside Park, uh, Margaret Pace Park, all the way into Coconut Grove, Kennedy Park, uh, all that shoreline has a lot of mixed terrain. And it's usually comprised of mangroves or riprap, which are the rocky shoreline, and all kinds of trash gets stuck in there. So those can be really, really heavy loads, uh, lots of trash, but they can be a little bit more adventurous. So you maybe want to have older kids, uh, you know, high school and above um, involved in those sorts of cleanups because they can be a little bit harder to navigate the terrain. Some people do kayaking or paddle cleanups and, you know, you can go to an island, you can go to uh, Monument Island, for example, and then there's neighborhood cleanups, right? Sometimes people like to just, you know, clean the, the streets of their neighborhood. Uh, Debris Free Oceans has done uh, some interesting um, pub crawl pickups in the Wynwood area where they have, like, they go from block to block and then they might step into a restaurant that has sponsored the event and they have, you know, a little cafecito or a treat and then they kind of make their way down the neighborhood. So there's all kinds of spins on the traditional uh, cleanup. Um, in terms of permissions, each entity has their own process, which can make it a little bit complicated. So here in South Florida, depending on what shoreline you are on, you may either be in the jurisdiction of Miami Beach, the city of Miami, uh, there's Miami-Dade County Parks and Recreation, and then there's Florida State Parks, and they all have a slightly different process. For the most part, City of Miami Beach does not require approvals. If you're on the flat sandy beach, you do not need any permit, uh, as long as you are not having a major commercial presence with a branded tent and, you know, selling or giving out branded uh, merchandise. The City of Miami Parks, which are pretty much all the ones on Biscayne Bay that I mentioned, Morningside, Legion Park, uh, Margaret Pace Park, etc., they have a different permit process through the city of Miami. Then you've got your county parks. So those are places like Hallover, Crandon, um, Matheson Hammock Park in the south. A lot of the locations on Key Biscayne are county parks. So it takes a little bit of understanding of the landscape to know who are who is the entity responsible. Uh, in no cases um, is there a fee required for these permits. So it's more like an approval. They all have like online forms that you have to submit. And for the most part, they just want to manage the volunteer activity. They want to make sure that there's not going to be two groups showing up to the same location on the same day to do a cleanup or putting a group there the day after a group was already there because that would make the cleanup not as productive. Uh, and then lastly, in this area, we have the Florida State Park. So that's primarily Olita 
um, in, in, in Miami-Dade, we've got Olita and Bill Bags, and they also have their own process. So that's sort of the first step is to kind of know who is the entity and then reach out for approval. And we are always available uh, to help facilitate that. If you don't know who the entity is or how to go about approvals, we can help facilitate that. Uh, so once you've chosen your time, date, and location and got your approvals, um, you can go ahead and post your cleanup to volunteercleanup.org. Um, as I mentioned, we aim to be the go-to destination for people to find out about cleanups. Um, we have a database of about 20,000 local volunteers that come to our website on a regular basis looking for cleanups. A lot of high school students who need service hours, a lot of concerned citizens who want to get involved in their community. Uh, I think one year we got nominated as the best second date <laughs> to go on. So, you know, lots of different people looking to get involved in their community. Um, we also have an e-blast that goes out every single Tuesday uh, to anyone who has opted into the weekly alerts. We'll send an email letting them know where cleanups are happening in within the 15 mile radius of their zip code for three weeks out. Um, so just by posting it, you know, you'll get a lot of traction that will go out to a lot of people. Uh, but of course, it's also helpful if you share your event page and the link to it to your own networks through email and social media. Uh, so I'm going to walk through the steps on how to organize uh, cleanup on our webs or how to post it rather. And then I'll take a quick pause <clears throat> for questions. Uh, so, you know, hopefully I don't need to give a tutorial on this part. If we've done our job, uh, <laughs> someone should be able to come to the website and, and organize the cleanup and post it without, you know, much help. Um, but, you know, first steps, organize a cleanup right from the main page. Um, there's usually three buttons in either from the main nav or uh, lower in the page. Um, if you're organizing a cleanup for the first time, it's going to ask you to create an account. And so that's just uh, putting in an email and a password, creating your account, and then it will ask you to check your email to confirm the account. Uh, so once you've gotten this email and you've confirmed your account, um, then you will be able to log in to what we call your dashboard. So your dashboard is basically your, you know, the the complete area where you're administrating your cleanups. It will show you all the cleanups you're attending, the ones you're organizing, uh, and from there um, you can manage all of your events. So the first time you would go from the left side, you'd say post a new cleanup, and then it's a very simple form. Um, there is also the option to create a public profile or what we call a landing page, um, and this is for people who maybe are leading frequent cleanups um, under they would have a page. So, for example, I'm going to I'm going to call on, on Diego. If Diego was organizing a cleanup, it would be volunteercleanup.org slash organizers slash Diego or whatever he put in his username. And under there, there would be all of the cleanups that <laughs> that he's he's organizing. Um, so that's the value of having the landing page. You know, just people might say, oh, when is your next cleanup? Right. I really want to come to one of yours. And so it'll have all of those listed. But this is an optional feature is to create the public landing page. And it's just going to have a little bio about you. Uh, your organization, you know, who you are, your, any of your social media tags, if you decide to put those in. Um, and this, then this is what it asks for in the form if you want to have a profile, so your social media accounts. Uh, you have the option to skip the profile if you don't want to have a public profile. And then um, you would be in the next step, which is putting in all the details of, of your cleanup. Um, so hopefully pretty straightforward. It's going to ask you, it's just a form that you fill out. What is the event title? Um, so this is fairly important because all of our uh, URLs, the links, you know, uh, much like Eventbrite, Eventbrite will just assign a series of characters to your event page. But here we customize it. So it's always volunteercleanup.org slash event slash whatever you call the title. Um, and so you, you'll see that in like the link, you know, that we created for, for this event. Um, so if I put in Matheson Hammock Park with volunteer cleanup, et cetera, um, that entire phrase would be the title. So we generally urge people to keep it fairly short because it is going to be the URL and maybe just include, you know, key parts like the organization's name or the event title. Um, then next you'll pick the date. So it's a calendar pop up. The Saturday and Sunday are at the end. You choose the date for your cleanup. And then it will ask you for the event address or a venue name. So this is all powered by Google Maps. And so if you were to just type in Matheson Hammock, you wouldn't necessarily have to know the address because Google Maps is smart and you could just choose that venue. Um, the caveat would be, you know, if you're on the beach at Fifth Street, that doesn't really have a specific address. So you could um, put that in. 
Um, but then there's an area to be a little bit more specific about exactly where you're going to meet, right? So if you're at the band shell, are you meeting on Ocean Terrace, you know, by the, the foot showers, or are you on the sand of the beach, right? So generally, um, we tell people to be specific. Um, it does allow you the option, oops, let me go back here, to um, put in an event graphic or a flyer and a banner. So um, there's actually two places you can have an image. The first one is called a banner. So that's more like a header or a picture of the event. And then the flyer is more like a downloadable. If there's something you wanted people to download and then share, uh, you could do that. Um, there's also event category. And so that gives people the option to decide if it's beach cleanup, if it's neighborhood cleanup, if it's a paddle cleanup. And then all of these things can be searched on. So once you put in these attributes for your cleanup, volunteers who then come to our website can search specifically if they want a paddle cleanup, um, if they're looking for a neighborhood cleanup. Um, then in the description, you know, it's just a, an open text box, you know, mangrove cleanup along the shorelines, be part of the solution, right? So you can put in whatever you want uh, about your cleanup, whatever description you want. Um, the next section, we have pre-populated some ideas um, for what either the volunteers should bring or what you will be providing. And so this is entirely up to you. Um, we usually tell volunteers to bring closed toed shoes and water in a reusable bottle, right? In general, we encourage a reduce, reuse uh, type of philosophy. So we don't really want people bringing single use plastic water bottles to a beach cleanup and we don't want organizers to be giving those out. Um, so those are some of the things that volunteers should bring. And then alternatively, there's the list of items that the host will be providing. Um, usually the organizers are providing at bare minimum, I would say, gloves and garbage bags uh, for the volunteers. And, you know, we've got all kinds of material lists that we can share about our suggested supplies and where we source them from. Uh, for example, the gloves that we use are reusable, machine washable. If you're doing many cleanups and you want to invest in that, they're about $1.15 a pair. You know, so for for a hundred bucks, you can get pretty much everything you need to run frequent cleanups. Uh, it is not an expensive uh, investment. Um, but yeah, bare minimum, usually gloves and garbage bags. If you're doing this a lot, maybe you're going to have pickers and buckets and those sorts of supplies, but definitely not um, not required. Uh, the next section to fill out is the meeting spot. Right. So, again, are you going to be on the beach or are you on the street? Uh, <clears throat> so this is just an open area for you to uh, figure out where you're going to meet. Matheson Hammock, for example, is a huge park and there's the marina and then there's the beach and then there's the trail and there's the boat launch. So you have to be really specific. You can't just say clean up at Matheson Hammock because no one's going to know where to go. Um, it's also a good idea to advise on parking. Um, some of the parks will waive the parking fee for volunteers. So if you're doing a, a cleanup at Bill Bags, um, they will often make the parking free. Um, is there street parking? Is it paid? You know, what, what's the deal there? So that area you can put. The next section is tickets. Um, and so this is fairly important. If you, if you didn't add any tickets, it would just be a static page. Nobody would be able to sign up for your cleanup. Um, so if you want people to sign up, if you want to manage capacity, let's say, for example, you're not comfortable having more than 25 volunteers, it's just you and a friend, you'd want to make tickets mandatory. So you want to make sure you don't get 100 people, sign, you know, showing up on the day of and you're not able to handle it. Um, so that's in the ticket tabs, you can give the ticket a name, and then you can put a ticket quantity. And so that is really the maximum capacity of how many you want to allow once 50 people have signed up the event will shut off and no, no one else will be able to, to sign up for the event. Um, you'll also have to indicate what is the start date and the, the end date of the ticket sales. Um, so it's not automatic. So for example, maybe you're posting the cleanup a month in advance, but you don't wanna open registration until the week before. Uh, most people usually have the ticket sales starting from the time that they post the event all the way up until the day of. But again, that's up to you. If you're preparing for the event and you want to cut registration off two days before so you know how much to be prepared for, that's up to you. Um, so just take note of that start date and end date for sales. That's the period, uh, the date and time during which people can, um, can sign up for your event. 
Now, next to the ticket details is another tab called settings. Um, and this is where you can determine if people can sign up to bring guests. Um, so some people have a personal preference. They want everyone to RSVP individually. Um, but maybe a family is coming for four and, you know, it's Dara plus three, right? So here is the area where you can determine the maximum number of tickets per order. So if it is okay that somebody brings Dave plus 20, then you have that option to indicate what is the maximum number of tickets. Uh, some people don't like for people to, you know, RSVP with huge groups because sometimes it can artificially inflate the number of people. Like somebody says, oh, I'm going to come with seven people and then come the day of event, it's just two people, right? And especially if you're limiting tickets, if you're saying you only want 50 and then all of a sudden the cleanup comes around and only 20 people showed up because a bunch of people signed up that really had no intention. So it's just, you kind of have to play that <clears throat> by ear and, and it's personal preference. Some people only want individual, some people are okay with a family signing up and some people think it should be unlimited. So this is the place where you have the option to determine how many tickets per order somebody uh, can do. So I hope that makes sense. Um, then there's some additional information that can be collected um, per attendee. And so we usually ask for attendee name and email as well as whether or not they need community service. So this is gonna be like a form when the person RSVPs, they're gonna be asked to provide the email. Um, this is especially good to do if you're doing groups, if you're allowing you know, Jennifer to RSVP plus four people, this way you collect everyone's email address and come the day of the event, God forbid there's a hurricane or a weather related incident, or you, know, you just wanna send a reminder email, you have everyone's email address in the system instead of just Jennifer plus four. So that's where you can uh, put those details in. Um, and then when you're finished uh, submitting the cleanup, then you know it's gonna say your event was su listed successfully to review your page, click here. You'll be able to preview your page. Um, you'll be able to you know see how it looks. If you need to make changes, um, you can go ahead and do that through the dashboard and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. <clears throat> so this is what it would look like, right? There's your banner image um, that you have, the time, date and location, all the details um, that, that you have. And so I think this is probably from when we first launched the website, but yeah, you can see at the top link, right? Volunteercleanup.org slash event, Mathis and Hammock Park with Vol So that's how the URL is displayed based on the title uh, with dashes in between the words. All right, let's see what's next here. All right, so I'm going to quickly pause um, before I go into the next section. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, I do have a few. Sure, go ahead. Um, so the first one was when you talked about like doing a safety briefing, is there any liability to the organizer? Uh, yes and no. Um, so we live in a country that's very litigious and people can sue for, for any purpose. Um, we do always suggest uh, getting a, a, a waiver signed and we make that available to hosts. Um, I, I would say in general, uh, there's not been an incident that I'm aware of, right? So um, anybody can sue anybody for anything, but in order for it to be an issue, somebody would really have to demonstrate that you were negligent, right? Just because somebody trips and falls on the beach does not make you negligent. Um, you know, so those are, are you know, some of the, the concerns. I am, a, I tend to be over cautious, um, you know, so I always like to make sure that a waiver is signed. Now, when volunteers sign up through our website, when they, they're essentially agreeing to a terms of service, and in the language on there basically excludes, you know, liability. So they're, they're basically releasing from liability us, our sponsors, our partners, which would include the host and the organizers. So there's already sort of a built-in mechanism uh, within the website, uh, but some organizations additionally want to collect waivers. We make those available to you and we are working on some modifications within the website to basically automate and streamline um, whether or not you want to use our default waiver or whether or not you want to upload your own. Okay, great. Um, I am curious about, so I'm here right by the band shell. Um, yep. Do you have recommendations on 
is it better to meet on the beach or is it better to meet like, you know, given this location I'm at, like, what would you recommend for the meeting place? Yeah, I think it depends if you have a tent or not. If you're going to be setting up a tent, it's very easy for people to find you on the beach. Um, if not, maybe you want to do it right at the entrance to the beach, you know, before you get onto the sand. Because if, if you don't have a, a table or a way to mark who you are and people come late and they might not be able to find you. Um, so I think that, you know, it has to do a little bit about, but um, I think it can go, I think it can go either way, uh, really. I mean, most people who have tents will set them up uh, on the sand. Uh, we do a lot of um, cleanups at South Point Park, and we always set up in the park, mostly because it's shaded, and we have like a table set up there. And from there, then we, you know, have people meet there and have leaders that then walk with them out to the beach and the pier. So um, I think it's just a matter of personal preference. Okay. Um, I know you said mostly you recommend closed toed shoes, um, for the beach cleanups is, do you still think that's a wise thing to do? I think again, personal preference. Um, I think on a flat sandy beach, you know, usually I, what I write is, you know, wear shoes that you're comfortable walking on the, the sand in, we suggest closed toed shoes, right? Um, there can be broken glass. There can be, you know, Portuguese man of war on the, on the beaches. Um, a lot of the cleanups that we do that are shoreline. So they're not flat, flat sandy beach. Um, we require closed toed shoes, but I think on a flat sandy beach, you have a little bit more flexibility. Okay. Um, will you, I, I forget, will you be sharing the link to, to the gloves and- Yes. Um, yep. Okay. We have a whole resource guide. Um, we're making some edits, but I can definitely share that. I'm also curious, um, have you found that there's an ideal lead time to post the event or make the tickets open in order to maximize you yes. know, the number of people uh, who sign up and show? Yeah, up? we usually like three weeks, I would say, you know, a month to three weeks. Um, our e-blast will tell volunteers what the cleanups are, like the, when they get the, the e-blast every week, it will include three weeks out. So I would say three weeks minimum. Um, you know, people can kind of be last minute in Miami, but um, also people plan ahead and, you know, they might get their weekends full. So we definitely think um, the sweet spot is, you know, somewhere between like three and six weeks at the most, I'd say. Um, some cleanups are regular, right? So there's some monthly cleanups uh, that happen regularly. You know, that's always a good thing if you're trying to get a thing going and people know, oh, it's always the second Saturday at the band show. Um, and I think, you know, also that just depends on how frequently um, you plan on doing it. But yeah, we, we usually see that people post it a, a couple weeks out. Okay. And last question, are the cleanups always two hours? No, they can be however long you want them to be. Um, we'll go through our framework for what we find is, is the sweet spot and, and, and why that is the case. Um, so yeah, so with that, um, let me go into the rest and we'll see if there's any other questions. Um, so basically, once you've promoted, you've posted the cleanup, you can start promoting it. Um, that includes, you know, spreading the word, sending the link out to different folks, um, doing your site visit. So like, just to your point, where are you going to set up? What is the, the boundaries of where volunteers uh, are going to be cleaning? Are there garbage cans on site? Are there water fountains on site? So you just kind of want to know uh, your area a little bit so that you can, can be prepared. Um, in general, these are the supplies that um, we recommend, um, you know, Sometimes if you're in a public park, you can you don't need the folding table, but there should be some sort of station, right? A table or some area if you're if you're at the you know the beach and you're leveraging the seawall, right? You can you can get creative, um, but there should be some sort of home base where people are checking in. Um, a water cooler is a great idea. If we're asking people to bring their own reusable water bottles, then there either should be a water fountain on site or a water cooler that maybe you're filling up from home. Um, you can get those sports style coolers for, you know, a, a couple of bucks, 10 bucks. Uh, garbage bags. Um, if you're doing this a lot, buckets are really useful. Um, we get ours donated from restaurants that are, are um repurposing you know they either get their soy sauce or their ketchup and mustard in five gallon buckets they give it to us and then we put the sticker on it um so buckets are great you can get those donated pickers can be useful um especially if you're in the mangroves for hard to reach areas and we have a source uh for pickers that we really like and they're about six dollars a piece uh the gloves um Again, about $1.15, they're the sort of uh, the nitrile dipped um, and reinforced on the palm. 
Uh, scale is a really good idea. We use, as you can see in this picture, it's a luggage scale, but they're very nice for weighing trash bags. Um, you just slide them through the, the hole and they're also about uh, 10 bucks. Um, we have a set of educational signs. I maybe have screen grabs of them, but we also can make that set available. Uh, waivers, um, your list of, of RSVPs. A first aid kit, you know, basic wound care is not a bad idea. If you are on a beach, you will have the lifeguards. Um, and they will have that stuff. But if you're in the mangroves and you're in a park that's not staffed, um, that might be something you wanna have just in case of any basic uh, cuts and scrapes. Uh, sunscreen, insect repellent. And we like to do prizes um, for the strangest thing that someone finds just to kind of make it fun and interesting. And maybe that can be something uh, donated from a local business. We give out uh, branded reusable uh, utensils that's to our, our groups. Um, all right, so the next step for, whoa, did I skip something here? Uh, the next step for doing the cleanup is sending a reminder email. Um, this is really critical for ensuring a good turnout, right? Sometimes may, people may be signed up three, four weeks in advance and come cleanup day, they forgot, right? So we always send a reminder email um, and we encourage them to sign the waiver. Um, we also encourage them to download CleanSwell. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but what to include in your reminder email, we usually send them, you know, one to two days in advance. So the link with the details, you want to recap where they should meet you, what to bring, what's provided, uh, maybe your contact information in case of questions or, or, or weather issues. Um, and you can send those in two ways. So through the event, through the event dashboard, I can show in a moment, um, there's a way to directly message your volunteers. So you can send a message directly through the system that will go out to everybody. Alternatively, you can download the spreadsheet of everyone who has registered for your event, and then you can send them an email through your email program of choice. Um, if you're doing that, though, I want to just remind everyone to make sure you use BCC, so Blind Carbon Copy, that is to protect volunteers' privacy. So if you're communicating with 50 people who do not know each other, they do not want their email shared with everybody else because inevitably someone's going to add them to a mailing list or someone's going to reply all and it's going to get very annoying. So if you use BCC, everyone will get the message, but they will only be able to reply to you directly. Um, if you message directly through the system, then you don't have to worry about that. All right, next comes the day of the cleanup. Now you've, you've posted your event, you've promoted it, you've sent your reminder, now you gotta show up and lead the event. So what does that look like? Um, so this is our framework for a two hour event. Um, your events can be longer or they can be shorter. This is just what we have found is a good amount of time. It basically includes an hour of cleanup. And that's what we found is sort of the, the time after which people start to get a little tired, you know, hot, sweaty, or bored. Um, so we allow about 10 minutes for volunteers to arrive and check in. People, of course, will sometimes be late. Um, we do a little introduction and a safety briefing. I'll talk about that in a moment, but we say who we are. We give some words of caution. Um, we then explain the tasks. We distribute supplies. We give them an hour to do the cleanup. Um, that includes a citizen science activity, which I'll talk about. And then um, we will set a specific time for them to regroup. So if our, if our cleanup is from 9 uh, to 11 at about 1030, we'll ask all volunteers to come back to the home base. And that's when we'll facilitate uh, a, brief a brief discussion, like a debrief conversation with the volunteers about what they found, how it made them feel. We will tally the bags, we'll weigh them, we'll take the group photo, and then um, we'll do the contest winners. So this is, you know, none of this is anything anybody has to do. Um, this is simply what we have found over 10 years of doing it is a really nice uh, framework. Um, so, you know, on the day of the cleanup, you're gonna set up your supplies. Um, probably a good idea to have somebody staffing the table, depending on how big your cleanup is, you might wanna have a dedicated person checking in volunteers, making sure the waivers were signed. Um, eventually, when we integrate the waivers into our website, you'll be able to look on your mobile phone and see if the volunteer has or has not signed the waiver. Uh, and if they have not signed a waiver, then you can do a QR code or a paper waiver. So there's different ways to do the waivers. Um, we'll do the safety briefing, et cetera. Um, and then after the cleanup, of course, you know, we like to share pictures on social media, uh, tag the location, tag any groups that showed up, um, and just spread awareness. 
Um, this is the Clean Swell app that volunteers can download to participate in a citizen science data collection. It's an app that the Ocean Conservancy uh, has developed. And as partners of the Ocean Conservancy and the International Coastal Cleanup, it's the one that, um, that we utilize. It's very user friendly. There are some other apps that are more science science as opposed to citizen science, um, but this is what we find is the most user friendly for the general population. Um, it's available on all of the different mobile platforms um, and it's a graphical interface. So it primarily asks them to catalog the top 10 things that they find, how many bottle caps, how many straws, um, how many cigarette butts. This app is used by volunteers worldwide and all of the information goes into a centralized database. So we're able to pull reports, we're able to track and trend things over time so we know what the major culprits are. Um, and that is the way that we are able to um, do educational campaigns or even um, policy issues. So we were able to uh, regulate and ban polystyrene, otherwise known as styrofoam in Miami Beach, uh, because we were able to demonstrate quantitatively how much of this we were pulling out of our marine ecosystem. Um, it's also the way that we know that bottle caps are now the number one item found on cleanups, whereas for the past 30 years, it was cigarette butts. Um, again, this is an optional activity, uh, but when volunteers come to a cleanup, we usually ask them to partner up in teams of two or three, and we have one person doing the data collection and another person uh, picking up the trash and putting it in the bag. So it, it kind of helps to the, do the team building or get people to know each other, or if they came as a family, you know, mom and dad can be doing the app and the kids uh, can be picking up the trash, right? So um, it's just something we encourage people to do. Um, it's kind of fun. You can get badges for the, the most trash that you pick up and um, it helps for the, the movement overall that we're able to collect this data. Uh, so the safety briefing. Uh, so these are some of the things that we say. Again, I have this scripted um, and one of the follow-ups that I can do is to send you that guide with all of the supplies as well as the bullet points on, on what we talk about. But, you know, we, we talk about the elements, make sure people are staying hydrated, uh, have plenty of water, that they're using sunscreen if they need, you know, I remember during the Zika days, it was like all about the insect repellent, right? So that was an issue. Um, we also make sure people are on the lookout for sharp objects or biohazards. Um, so depending on the terrain, you can see here South Point Park uh, and Pier, um, there are rocks, right? So people make sure they don't fall and get scraped, uh, broken glass. And um, the biggest precaution that I really worry about are, are the, you know, the small chance, but usually we find one per cleanup, uh, a hypodermic needle. And the best practices in that case, it should somebody find a needle is to very carefully with gloves on, put it inside of a wide mouth bottle, like a Gatorade bottle and put the cap on and dispose of it separately. And so it's really just basic common sense is that people should not take an exposed needle and put it into a garbage bag that could poke out and graze somebody. Um, you know, same thing with broken glass, right? The, the few times I've seen somebody get some cuts and scrapes is they put broken glass into a garbage bag that's not that sturdy. And then when they lift the bag to take it to the trash, it might poke out. Um, if they're in the mangroves, you know, they just need to be, again, basic common sense um, and just making sure that they're not going to, you know, poke their eye out. Um, what we always tell the little kids is that we want them to pick up with their eyes first before they pick up with their hands. So just to be mindful of what they're um, what they're touching. Um, it's always good to scope the area in advance. Are there heavy mosquitoes? Are there Portuguese man of war? A lot of times volunteers will see that those blue, they're kind of like bubble man of war. If we live in Miami Beach, you probably know what they look like, but sometimes volunteers that don't know think it's a balloon or it's a water bottle and they might touch it by accident. Uh, we usually encourage people to focus on the familiar man-made plastic items that don't belong in the marine environment. The everyday things like the straws, bottle caps, you know, all the food items. Any dead animals, natural debris, palm fronds, coral shells, all of that can be left in place. Um, and if they see anything that looks dangerous or unfamiliar or freaks them out, right? You know, there could be a baby diaper, there could be a condom, uh, there could be lots of things that we find on the beach that maybe volunteers don't want to touch and that's okay, right? Nobody has to touch anything that they don't want to. Um, but the plastic uh, pieces we really focus on because they can be harmful to animals and wildlife. Um, once we're doing the cleanup, we encourage a team approach, so like two to three people. Uh, so they're working either pairs. Again, one person can be doing the data and the other person can be carrying the garbage. Another person can be picking up the trash with gloves. 
Um, you can send volunteers to different areas. So if you're on a beach, some can go north and some can go south. Some can comb, can comb the, um, the seaweed line, others can be in the, the dunes. So you wanna separate them into different areas so they're not all clustered in one spot. Um, we like to set a return time so that everybody comes back and that we can do the debrief. For us, it's really important that volunteers have an experience that's more than just pick up trash, go home. And that goes back to what I said in the beginning that for us, this is an educational opportunity. It's not just about the cleanup, it's about spreading awareness. So we like to have everybody come back, talk about what they found, do the conversation, and then have um, the photo. Uh, so then when they're done with the cleanup, there's just a couple of things that we have them do. Um, we consolidate the trash into as few bags as possible so that we're not, you know, wasting bags. That's why we use the bucket so that we consolidate it all. We'll weigh the bags using that trash scale. Um, we will facilitate that cleanup discussion. We give out the contests and prizes. We usually do it for the person who finds the strangest thing. Um, and so we ask people to kind of be on the lookout just to make it a little fun. Then we take the, um, the group photo and sign community service hours. We do have a template for community service hours. So if um, you are not a nonprofit, we, we work with many groups, some who are their own 501c3 nonprofits and don't have a community service form to use, or sorry, that they do. Um, otherwise, we work with community leaders and student groups that may not have that. So we always provide um, that if you need. We can give it to you in advance so that you can print it and then just simply write their name on it on the day of, or we can give you a digital version that you can send it to them via email. It's a lot easier if you do it on the day of, um, otherwise there can be a lot of back and forth like, oh, I attended the cleanup, I need my service hours. And then it becomes a little bit of a, of a detective uh, project to find out, okay, well, did they actually show up or did they just register? So um, where possible, you know, we ask that during the registration, who needs community service hours so that you'll know, oh, out of my 50 people, 10 need community service hours. So that's how many I'm gonna print. Um, so we make all these things available for you. When we do the debrief conversation, um, this is sort of the cliff notes of what we say, but we usually do about a 10 to 15 minute wrap up. And again, I have this all scripted into bullets that I can give it to you, but we try to answer um, these five basic questions. So what is marine debris? Uh, how bad is the problem? So we wanna quantify it. And there's a number of different ways to do that, right? Um, you know, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish by the year 2050, um, or there's 21,000 pieces of plastic pollution for every single person on the planet, right? Different ways that we can talk about that. Um, we talk about the impacts uh, of marine debris, you know, why this is such a big problem. In fact, it's the second most important environmental threat um, after sea level rise and climate change. So we talk about the impacts to wildlife, um, to our marine ecosystem, and of course, um, some uh, new research showing the impacts to human health. We talk about where it's coming from, which is primarily through storm drains originating as street-based litter, but sometimes can also be from uh, beachgoers not disposing of their trash properly. Um, we talk about some of the issues with um, improper uh, infrastructure, right? Not enough trash cans on the street or improper uh, management of the islands, the spoil islands where many boaters uh, recreate on the weekends, right? Not having the right protocol. So we talk about some of those challenges. And then um, we always conclude with what we can do about it. How can individuals reduce plastic waste uh, in their own lives? What are some of the solutions? We usually encourage people to focus on their individual behaviors, things that they can control, their own consumption. And then for the people that are more interested in getting involved, um, you know, what are some of the things on the activist path, right? How to attend community meetings and speak up, how to advocate for more trash cans in your neighborhood if you need one, and of course, how, how to lead a cleanup. Uh, so this is sort of the, the big picture, and we have these um, graphics available. Uh, we've got a whole set of actually slides that we give in our debrief. There's like what I, it's what I call my low tech PowerPoint. They're basically like the size of a politician yard sign and they go through each of those five talking points. Um, but this is the big picture, right? The idea that it's starting with us and our choices, um, all of the single use plastics that we are finding. In fact, most of the items that we find on the beach cleanups come from items that we use to eat and drink every day. They are primarily single use plastics and they are uh, primarily 
uh, food and beverage consumption items. So of course we use these things, we don't dispose of them properly. Um, the litter goes into the storm drain, it goes out to the, the, the canals, eventually it leads into the ocean, it breaks up into smaller pieces, the sea life might eat it by mistake, and then all of a sudden it's on our uh, fish sandwich. So this is sort of like the big picture uh, of what we usually talk to volunteers about. Um, so that's most of what I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I probably should also quickly show, um, let me see here, what it looks like to manage uh, your cleanup in the dashboard. Let me see if I can do that. Hold on. I have to get out of my PowerPoint here. All right. Let me try that one more time. Um, share. Do, 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 do. I'm going to share my whole screen. Can you do that? All right. Can you guys see my event dashboard? Do you guys see that here? So once you're logged in, if I say cleanups I'm hosting, it's gonna show me uh, all of my events. And then you have all of these options here. So you can edit, the pencil lets you edit your cleanup. If you, if you put in the wrong date or you wanna change the description, you can go there too. Um, if you need to get your volunteer list, uh, that's where you export registration. Uh, so you can use that option. And then from here, it'll show you all of your events and you can pick which one you want. And, you know, you would just download the, the uh, Excel spreadsheet. That's how once you guys registered, I then emailed you later and said, hey, here's the Zoom link um, profile landing page. I can show you what that looks like as well. Um, this is where you can fill out all of your information. And then uh, when you're on the website, let's see, uh, it should show me, let's see my account, this is the dashboard. And there's two ways you can get to it, either just from that drop down, or you can go from, from the left. So if it says cleanups, I'm hosting, this is going to show me all of the cleanups that I'm hosting. And if I were to uh, click on any one of them, for example, uh, it would take me to the page. So if you ever forget your URL, you can go to the dashboard and then you can just copy and paste it from there. But if you scroll down to the bottom, this is where it gives you the organizer information. So this is me, volunteercleanup.org. Here's a little bit about me. And if I say more info, um, this is where it will show me all of the cleanups under my profile page. So you can see at the top event organizer, volunteer cleanup, Dara, because Dave has his own profile. And then I can see from here any of my past events, um, any of my upcoming events, et cetera. So this is where I can find all of my cleanups. Um, we are always interested in hearing from you guys on what would be useful as enhancements or additions. Um, so one of the things that we're working on is how to clone or duplicate a cleanup. So if you've posted it once and it's a monthly event, um, we want you to be able to just reproduce that into the future and not have to um, constantly repost it. So things like that um, you know, we can add as enhancements. This is sort of an ongoing uh, tool that we have built for your purposes, right? So as people who lead cleanups, um, we've tried to think, you know, very, very, um, you know, detailed about what anybody would need when organizing a cleanup. So if you have any suggestions or thoughts as you use things, if you run into any problems or have ideas, um, just shoot us an email. We're always uh, open to that feedback. So um, we are at time. I do not have a hard stop, so I'm happy to uh, stay on and answer any questions that you guys have. I have one. Sure. So I'm curious, what do you give for prizes? Oh, so um, we give, um, we have these reusable utensil sets. Now, you know, keep in mind, we're a nonprofit, right? So we have a budget for these things. So we have purchased um, these reusable utensil sets that Dave is going to show you. Um, so these are branded. It says volunteercleanup.org. Everyone is a change maker. And it comes with um, fork, spoon, knife, and uh, chopsticks. So everything you need for food truck night, anything you need for uh, you know travel, it has a clip onto your bag. We give that away. Um, if you're in the North Beach area, um, you know, 
Uh, maybe I could work with on getting some tickets to the band shell, or you could um, find a local restaurant who maybe wants to give, you know, sandwicherie, a free sandwich at sandwicherie. Um, or you can just make it bragging rights, right? Like, hooray for you, you win the contest, right? So um, a lot of the events that we do are corporate events. And so, you know, we, we invest in these little giveaways. Stickers, people love stickers. Um, those are also inexpensive, um, you know, that you can get and they put it on their, you know, their reusable bottle or their computer. Um, but th those are what we, we try to reinforce the reduce reuse, right? We try to give away prizes that help people do the thing that we're trying to encourage. So a reusable water bottle, a reusable shopping bag, those sorts of things. Do you have any that are for sale that like the organizers could buy from you and uh, yeah, I'm sure we could do that. Yeah, for sure. You know, we probably even if you're if you're leading regular cleanups, um, you know, that's something you're doing on an ongoing basis, and you're posting them to our website, um, then we do, you know, have a budget to support you, right? We can make gloves available to you, or we can give you, you know, a couple of our, our sets of utensils, we'd be happy to do that. Are you doing it? Um, help you get more people and more volunteers. Thank you. All so right. Much. This was great. Thank you guys. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much.